thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, my personal interest in the subject came from the fact that uh, I was both in the camp memorial at Dachau for about three years in the mid-90s and, and helped work on the 50th anniversary of liberation. And when that finished, I moved to Sarajevo and I was working in Sarajevo at the end of the Bosnian conflict. So I got public history experience kind of on the ground, so to speak, and that's where my interest in comparative genocide has come from. As you can imagine, the topic of comparative genocide is enormous, and there are uh, a number of ways that we could approach this, but I want to look at it uh, kind of pedagogically with some background information, but also how do I take a topic that's enormous, squish it down for you guys, so you guys can take it and squish it down further if you do it in classes, into smaller lectures. But before I begin, what I'd like you to do is do a one minute writing exercise for me. And everybody's got a pen, everybody's a paper. What I want you to do, and this was on the sheet that I had sent around with the readings, so some of you may already have it, but I'd like you to just write down your personal definition of genocide. So in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to take on three things. Talking about the pedagogical applications of teaching genocide. And talk about what is genocide and why we might put it into a course curriculum. And then I'm going to talk about the background development of the term and of the concept. So I'm taking a holistic approach. I'm not going to talk about individual cases of genocide. If you want to do that in the Q&A, I'm very happy to. But rather, I thought rather than giving you the top 10 genocides, and we'll talk about the concept of them. There is a top 10 list. The top of the list for everything. Right? I thought we'd talk about it as a whole. And you'll notice that the readings that I said you were also that, talking about some of the problematic issues in working with genocide, putting it in the classroom, um, and even just defining the term. The other thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to give you a slideshow. I started to put a slideshow together, scared myself, and thought, we, particularly after lunch, we don't need the images. If you want to see the images, you can Google all of them, but rather than, than flashing you piles of machetes and other things, uh, ovens, I will give, a, give you a, a straight talk. So for those of you who are visual learners, I apologize that there are no visuals, but you will thank me. Uh, later. So, I want to start with the question, why add it to the curriculum? Often when you get added to a curriculum, other than the state decides it's going to be added, there is often this idea of, with pedagogy, we're going to create global citizens, aware citizens, uh, participatory uh, members of society. Uh, what we want to do is we want to get citizens interested in a sensitivity to diversity, a sensitivity to difference, uh, uh, taking on moral and ethical questions. And that's often why topics like this come up. In, uh, and following those aims, uh, the first venture into doing this was, of course, Holocaust education, which takes off in the late 1980s, uh, really becomes kind of more, uh, more of a takeoff in the, late or in the middle 1990s and implementing Holocaust into, into college, or into, excuse me, into the high school systems. And I was asking the gentleman I was having lunch with whether or not it's a mandate uh, for the high schools here in Texas. And again, having worked with some educators through the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, I know how short your time is and how we squish the Holocaust down into units. So just imagine doing that with, with genocide. But I, uh, we started to do it in order to honor the commitment that became the term used after the Holocaust, which is never again. Right? We're never going to do this again. We're never going to have this happen again. Well, we failed at that, if, we, if, it's, if it's never going to happen again, because it has happened again. The 20th century is the century of genocide. That's how we've come to define it. Uh, and it's really a post-45 century, in many ways, of, of the degree that genocide has taken off. <laughs> The final pedagogical reason, or uh, main pedagogical reason for adding this to a curriculum okay, is uh, the weight of the future. Right? right now, a lot of schools are teaching Holocaust education. I argue that in 10 to 15 years from now, we will see Holocaust education in some places, but we're going to move to the global, right, as we move from Western Civ to global education in some ways, 
we're going to move uh, from Holocaust to comparative genocide. And just as that first move is problematic, so too is that move from Holocaust to genocide, but I see it coming. I see you guys being faced with, if you're teaching a history class, having to do a unit on comparative genocide. Whether it's Holocaust or comparative genocide, there is a challenge that goes with this subject that is, uh, you do find in, in Soviet history, in Gulag history, and elsewhere, uh, and that is the question of teaching the uncomfortable, and how you teach students uh, about a, a difficult and an uncomfortable and an emotional topic. Uh, students often suffer from Holocaust fatigue these days. And that Holocaust fatigue is rooted in things like video games, casual references on TV on one side, and then coupled on the other side, this intense education about you should, you should feel something for this story that I'm telling you. And so you've got banal on one side, and then this, this moral and ethical overlay on the other side. And it, it creates sometimes conflicting emotions in students and causes a set of Holocaust fatigue. Uh, the problem with Holocaust fatigue and even when you're talking about war studies in general, is that most of the students know their experience, and I hope it stays this way, but their experience is from artificial means. It's from television, it's from video games. TV has an on-off switch, video games have a reboot button. So death is not a permanent state. So how do you translate from death is not a permanent state to death is a very permanent state for millions of people? And that's one of those, those challenges. Uh, when we look at applicability, there is, we like to, to create a hierarchy of suffering. Right? And you often, one will often compare one's suffering to the most extreme form. And it has been, in the, uh, up till now, the Holocaust is the extreme form of suffering. Now we're starting to see genocide being the extreme form. What do I mean by people comparing it? Well, you get things like the super Nazi. Extreme soup guy will not give you soup. Okay. He's, he's as cruel as. Or you get tree holocaust for deforestation. It's a major event. We'll call it a holocaust. You get the implication of its impact. We, we also see, again, uh, coupled with that, this, this casual reference again, uh, Family Guy. Love the series, but has a number of, of genocide and holocaust references. Entire episode on something called Duck How. Slaughterhouse. So you have these casual references. On the on the on the other hand, you have this this hierarchical regime of my suffering is as bad as the extreme example. And so one of the first questions you have to think about with students is, do I want to create a hierarchy of suffering, or do I, I create a, a a a spectrum of suffering that's not hierarchical, where there's a comparative element? Yes but that you're not trying to make something as bad as, or worse than, a particular event. Uh, I'm going to, you know, one of the other difficulties with teaching is age of students and what is appropriate. This is where you folks are the experts, I'm not. So you, you will know what fits with your students, you will know the issue of balance, not only time-wise, but sort of what they are prepared for at the emotional levels that you teach to put this information in. But I think no matter what their, their prep level, the big question is, how do you get across the scale of something like genocide without dehumanizing the victims? How do you make people aware that we're talking about individuals on a collective and a massive scale? And then the final point is what I have come to call the so what question. You teach all this lecture and then your kids say, so what? What do I do with this information? Some will just revel in the horrific images, but the real challenge when you teach a class on comparative genocide is to move the next step over and talk about what do you do with that information and how do you go out into society with that information? Um, and are you changed or is this just something you let roll over you? So those I think are some of the pedagogical challenges that face the concept of teaching genocide or, or Holocaust studies. Uh, as I said, the 20th century was a century of genocide, uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, it has been much more, as we have seen post-45, than just the Holocaust. Many people will come into a genocide class with the assumption that it will be a second Holocaust class. And actually, I don't talk about the Holocaust all that much when I teach a semester-long course on comparative genocide. 
I use the Holocaust as a comparative point, but we don't have a special lecture on it. Uh, one of the things, and, and the reason I don't, is because every case of genocide is so different. And that's what makes it problematic, is you, you develop a definition and then there are exceptions as you're going through. For instance, um, if we use the Holocaust as the definition of genocide, then it is death, uh, excuse me, death through mechanization. The, the Holocaust was bureaucratic, and it used technology. And so is that our marker of genocide? Well, if it is, then how do we classify Rwanda, where we had 800,000 people killed with machetes in 100 days? Right. So that's that, that issue there. When we talk about uh, scope and scale of genocide, post-45, because that's when we've had the term, but we can go back and look at cases of genocide from prehistory all the way through. Uh, there have been 50 plus cases of genocide post 1945. Uh, there have been thousands throughout history. And just to give you an example, this is one of the, the first books that came out on genocide, on, on teaching genocide. And that's, this is the history and sociology of genocide. And it's an analysis of case studies. And these gentlemen both work with the term and then go back in history to things like the Knights of the Temple, Christians in Japan, witch hunts in Europe, uh, Tasmanians. Herrero in Southwest Africa, all of those cases before we even get into the 20th century. So can we retroactively apply the term genocide as well? Do we, uh, one of the things we were talking about at lunch was middle passage, is it or is it not a genocide? And these are the kinds of questions that you can, you can work with. The other, when it comes to defining genocide, one is, do we pick a benchmark case and then what happens when things don't match up to the benchmark case? The other criteria for defining genocide that many people use is the issue of numbers. Right? If we've got numbers, then it's a significant death, right? And it's a significant event that can give it the label of genocide. The problem with that is can we really quantify genocide? Once you put a number to it and you say, somebody give me a figure. 300. 300, okay. 300. Anything over 300 is a genocide. So if I want to avoid international criminal courts, I stopped at 299. <laughs> Didn't commit a genocide. Right. Million people died, it's a genocide. Not million minus one, and it's not a genocide. So that's the problem with these numerical values. We want to look at the big picture. Uh, we want to look at, you know, uh, and we have horrific numbers. Uh, Idi Amin in Uganda, often seen as a genocide, 300,000 people. Uh, Franco in Spain, 30,000 dissidents died. We've got, of course, the case of six million Jews plus uh, another six million others when we talk about the, the Holocaust and its order. We have Stalin, and that number is what, astronomical. We have uh, cases in Ethiopia, North Korea, in Cambodia, in Japan. All of these cases, are, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. So the number is big, but we want to be careful that we don't put a number on it because that causes, uh, that causes complications in understanding. There are, of course, various definitions of genocide. I gave you the websites that, that listed a couple of them. There are basically three definitions of genocide. There is what we call the ordinary meaning, uh, which is often something like murder by government of people, uh, uh, or murdered by a government of a people due to their national, ethnic, racial, or religious membership. Right, so membership of a group, and then the state coming in and executing them. That's the, what we'll call an ordinary. Then we have what we call a generalized meaning of genocide, which is very similar to the ordinary meaning, but also includes the government killing people according to political opponents, right, or international murder. So if we look at the first categories, whether they're national, ethnic, racial, and religious, that would then rule out Cambodia, right? which is a class right? or a, uh, a political movement. So some people have gotten more generalized and put those terms into their genocide. And then, of course, the last one is the legal definition. Right? And that is the international treaty. We're talking about the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. And this definition includes things that are not forced, not only forced killing. We get the elimination of groups by preventing births, uh, forcibly transferring children to other places. And so if you use this definition, it raises the question about 
indigenous schools in Canada, for example, where the motto was, kill the Indian, save the child. Uh, things like ethnic cleansing fall under this legal definition of genocide. And for every act of genocide, there are 15 or 20 definitions of genocide. So it's a very fluid uh, concept. It, it's a very tricky concept to, to define, but it's also a very useful concept to, to spend some time. And that's what I want to do after, we, after the break is spend a little bit of, of time talking about definitions, which is why I had all of you write down you know, your, the, the one that rattles around in your head first. Because we all know what genocide is, but once we start talking about particulars, we realize that we don't necessarily all agree on what genocide is. What I want to do now, though, is give you a little bit of a background on how the study of genocide comes about, and, and the idea that we need to have a global awareness of a mass atrocity like this. And I want to start with a little vignette, and this comes from A Problem from Hell, which is the book from Samantha Powers, and if you've been watching the news lately, this is the book that they talked about when, they're talking, when we looked at Obama's appointment to be representative of the U.S. to the U.N. This is the same Samantha Powers. So this is the book she wrote while she was in Bosnia, and it took the, the Pulitzer Prize. But she opens, this is from her opening chapter, it's called Trial by Fire. On March the 14th, 1921, on a damp day in the Charlottenburg district of Berlin, a 24-year-old Armenian crept up behind a man in a heavy gray overcoat, swinging his cane. The Armenian, Telerand, placed a revolver at the back of the man's head and pulled the trigger, shouting, This is to, the, to avenge the death of my family. The burly target crumpled. If you have heard the shot and spotted the rage distorting the face of the young offender, you might have suspected that you were witnessing a murder to avenge a very different crime. But back then, you would not have known that the crime is genocide, because the word did not exist. So the event, we opened with right, a Armenian taking out a Turkish representative in the early 20s. Key on this is the term genocide, well, we associate it with the Holocaust, actually doesn't start with the Holocaust. The, the crime that Talran was, was dealing with was the execution of his family and of his group. At the end of the 19th century, in the beginning part of the 20th century, his, it was directed against the young Turks. Uh, what had happened is Russia, in declaring war on Turkey, had um, invited Armenians to live in Turkey okay, uh, and to rise up against the Turks. That's the, that's the justification that the young Turks use, that we have to get rid of this internal threat that may take our nation. And so uh, it becomes a principle of collective guilt. Not all of the Armenians plan to, up, to rise up, but the young Turks decide we have to take them out before we even give them a chance, collective guilt. So the young man who pulled the trigger, to give you a little bit of his back history, June the 15th, was uh, June 1915, he was 19 years old. He and his mother and his sisters, one was 15, one was 16, and one was 26 and had her own child, as well as his two brothers, aged 22 and 26, along with 20,000 other people from his village, were marched out of the village and marched into arid land. It's going to be a forced march to death. On the march, his sisters, all of them, were raped repeatedly. His 22-year-old brother had his head cleaved in with an axe. His mother was shot. He himself, Talrad, was struck and left for dead. And he was the only survivor of that 20,000-plus group. So they, they didn't want to leave survivors. They thought he was dead. He survived. What was the international community's reaction to this? Not a lot. It was not a great deal of hue and cry. Uh, in May of 1915, the Allied government dis does post a declaration of crimes against humanity and civilization. America steps out of that process and says we're not actually going to support that declaration. There is a proposition that goes forward to form an international court to deal with crimes against humanity and civilization. But despite the arguments of men like Morgenthau Sr., the Americans back out of it, and if the Americans gone, there's also not support from the other leading nations. It 
falls by the wayside. Talat, the man who ordered the executions, the man at the head of the Young Turks, uh, does face some discussion based on was this a religiously motivated crime? <coughs> he basically gets off. He starts boasting about his accomplishments in public, happily moves to Berlin and continues with his life until uh, until his his assassination. Uh, when we look at popular press coverage of, of what was going on in 1915, we do see in the New York Times there was 145 articles published. The reason that there were so many is that the editor of the New York Times at the time was a friend of Morgenthau Sr. and so bowed to his pressure for the articles in. We see in March 1915 words used like massacre, slaughter, atrocity. Uh, that's the language that is available. We see another article in October that says 800,000 Armenians destroyed, and then in December, millions killed or exiled. Uh, the reason that I bring up press coverage is that this becomes a very useful exercise in classroom settings for students, of something I do with my, my university students, definitely can be done with my high school students, newspaper archives. Send them into online newspaper archives or hard press archives for a particular genocide, have them count what kind of coverage is there. Have them count the types of words that are used to describe an event. Do they actually use genocide now that the term, or do they use another term? Also, have them look at the placement of the event uh, and the description of the event on the newspaper page. Is it tucked on the left-hand side at the bottom, and we, we read left to right, so the bottom left is usually the least important. Is it tucked down there? Is it tucked in with the advertisements? So you have one article on X million died, and then ooh, shoe sale, which is what my students found this year. And so that becomes, and it begins to, to make students aware of, it's not only the event, but how that event is covered, how that event is reported. I want to turn back to the Armenian case. Uh, in April of 1919, there's a tribunal set up. Uh, there, is a, there is a case, as we say, but Talat is living peacefully in Germany. He doesn't face any of the charges. So in 1920, Talran, the man who lost his entire family, joins a Boston-based Armenian group plotting to assassinate young Turkish leaders. And it's called Operation Nemesis and he is given the task of killing Talat. So this, is, this brings us up to that, that morning of Shalat murder. And this is where Lemkin, the man who's going to set up the term genocide, comes into the picture. In 1921, Lemkin is a 21-year-old Polish Jew studying linguistics at the University of Lvov. He hears about the case in the newspaper, and he asks his professor, isn't there any court, isn't there any law to try to laugh for what he's done. And the reply from the professor is this, and I quote, consider the case of a farmer who owns a flock of chickens. He kills them, and this is his business. If you interfere, that is trespassing. So genocide is a flock of chickens. So Lemkin's reaction to this, uh, so it is a crime for Telrad to kill a man Tehran is, is captured at the site of shooting and is will able to be executed. Is that it's a crime for a man to shoot a man, but it's not a crime for his oppressor to kill more than a million people. And this starts Lincoln thinking about state sovereignty and some of these larger issues. Fast forward to 1933, Lemkin is now a lawyer. He plans to speak before the International Criminal Trial Conference in Madrid. He wants to offer a paper that connects Hitler to the Young Turks in Armenia. So what is what the potential that Hitler's posing in Germany now to what had gone on in Turkey? And then his, the overarching question he's asking is, what is our place in preventing this from happening again? Lincoln is not allowed to speak. He's not given a visa to travel to Madrid. The topic is taken off the table. And interestingly enough, in 1939, one of the, because of the lack of international recognition of the Armenians, this gives Hitler drive to go forward with his plan. And he makes a very famous statement in 1939 to his generals, who remembers Armenia? So 
So if that, if it, if that slaughter took place and nobody remembers it, nobody's going to argue with, with our slaughter. Question becomes, what kind of a boy was Lemkin? I mean, how does he end up on this, this path? He grew up in a small village about 50 miles outside of, of Yellowstock, one of the places that ironically in the, in the Nazi regime ends up in a major ghetto. Uh, at age 12, uh, he started to read about Nero and feeding Christians to lions, so he had a somewhat questionable taste in literature. Uh, when he was six years old, local pogroms swept through the area, killing 70 in his village and injur injuring 90. So he saw firsthand uh, this idea of, of violence against an other. Uh, starts his interest, and then in 1920, as I say, he ends up in the University of Kowalov. He is he's fascinated by philology, the study and evolution of languages. He speaks Polish, German, Russian, French, Italian, Hebrew, and Yiddish. He wants to learn Arabic and Sanskrit in his spare time. But the Talat case shifts his attention away from, from languages and back to this, uh, to this issue of state sovereignty and rights. So in his Madrid paper, he was hoping to argue the, the need to ban barbarity and vandalism. He defines barbarity as premeditated destruction of national, racial, religious, and social collectives. And he defines vandalism as the destruction of works of art, culture, and intellectual life. So he's not only talking about the murder of a people, but he's talking about the murder and elimination of a culture as well. But again, he does not give that paper, he's refused a visa. Few are interested in what he has to say. And then, of course, in September of 1939, Germany invades Poland, and we know what happens from there. Lemkin himself flees from his, his village. You can see the writing on the wall. He ends up, he's got a long journey. He ends up in Sweden in February of 1940. He's giving various lectures. He contracts, or he contacts various American universities, including Duke University, offering his, his work as a translator. He manages to secure a visa to come to the United States, which is not easy because uh, some of you may be familiar with the case of the St. Louis in May of 1939, where a number of, of just under a thousand Jews with, with visas were turned away from Cuba and across the US and sent back to Europe. So he is one of the lucky ones. He manages to get a visa. So he travels from Sweden to Moscow to Vladivostok to Japan, finally to Vancouver, and then he enters into the United States, and he manages to travel some 14,000 miles talking to university presidents. And the argument that he makes is that women, children, and old people were murdered 100 miles from here. Wouldn't you run to help? Then why do you stop this decision of your heart when the distance is 3,000 miles instead of 100? So this is the argument that he's making to, to university professors. He goes on a lecture circuit, he goes on a lobby circuit, 1942 to 43, that's when he's touring these 14,000 miles. He meets with the president of Washington. His own family is still missing. He doesn't know where his family is, but he's driven by this mission. He returns to this idea of, of genocide in August of 1941 because in August of 41, on a BBC interview, Winston Churchill says, We are in the presence of a crime without a name. He's referring to the Holocaust. Lemkin realizes from Churchill's statement that a term is needed, not just for the Holocaust, or what we will eventually call the Holocaust, but the larger picture. So he secures a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and he writes a book, and it's published in 1944. It's called Access Rule in Occupied Europe. 712 pages, it's 360 pages of decrees out of the seven. What's important about this book is it's the first time the word genocide is used. Chapter 9 of this book is titled Genocide. So the term gets into circulation, or so lived in hopes. He has been very deliberate with this term. He has rejected a number of words. He's rejected words like mass murder because it fails to incorporate a singular motive. He rejects denationalization because it means the denial of citizenship and not more, and clearly more is going on. Uh, there's the idea of Germanization, but that forced assimilation is missing a biological component that's, that's present in something like Germanization, 
but not necessarily present in cases like Armenia. He takes his inspiration from a very interesting source, George Eastman of Kodak. He likes the term Kodak. He likes it because it's short, it's not capable of mispronunciation, and it does not resemble anything in art. It cannot be associated with anything in art except for Kodak. So he's along the line of the Kleenex thought. Kleenex is a brand name, but then it becomes the term that represents all. So from this motivation of Kodak, Lebkin coins in their term, geno, race and tribe, side meaning killing, genocide. 1944, the term gets listed in Webster's. In 1953, it makes it into the Oxford English Dictionary. It is controversial and problematic from the very beginning. And Lemkin keeps arguing that statesmen and citizens need to learn from the past without letting it paralyze them, but it appears that this concept of genocide is going to at least legally paralyze people. World War II ends, you've seen the films on liberation of the camps, evidence emerges that there has been a mass atrocity. We get an international military tribunal is set up, one in Japan, one in Germany, and Nuremberg, the Nuremberg one runs from November 45 until October 46. Here, even though we have the term genocide, it's not in the four crimes that the charged members will be accountable for. It's merely in the description. So what Lemkin realizes is that words are not enough. We need a law to back the word. So 47, 48, he acts again tirelessly to ground a law. In December of 1948, finally get a, gets a text adopted. The U United Nations now has a human rights treaty. In January of 1951, that human rights treaty becomes the prevention and punishment of genocide. It enters into force. 20 countries ratify it. Bunch of countries sign it, but only 20 countries ratify it. It's important to remember the difference between signing and ratifying. Signature in, shows intent. I intend to become a party of the convention. Signature does not obligate the state, the signee, to take any further actions. So we've got this, we've got a lot of countries, representatives saying this is a great idea, but we really don't want to get involved. And the US is one of them. The US signs, but refuses to ratify. When it is only when it is signed but not ratified, it cannot make a claim on the relative treaty. When the treaty is ratified, then it really comes into force. So it's in limbo, starting in 1951. Meanwhile, Lemkin is nominated for the Peace Prize in 1950, in 51, in 52, in 58, and 59. He never wins. He begins a, a work in a four-volume set, and publishers say there is no way we can sell a book on genocide. Nobody is interested. So this is immediately after what we see as the benchmark genocide case. The publishers are saying, we have moved on. We are now looking at the Cold War, fascists are out, communists are in. There's nobody interested in his biography. He dies in 1959, and seven people attend his funeral. But the fight is not over. Enter another character, William Proxmire, a Democrat from Wisconsin, between 68 and 87. Uh, he hands out what he calls the Golden Fleece Awards, to protest excessive spending by the government agencies. And he, in these years, takes up Lincoln's charge of ratification. He never missed a roll call in the Senate, ever. 22 years, 10,000 votes, something like, according to my source, 3,211 speeches on the issue of genocide. Every speech he makes is unique, and from a conversation that uh, I had with Dr. Walsh, Dr. Walsh helped write some of those speeches. I wrote them. You wrote all of them? Oh, okay. so a few. A few. A few. Oh. <laughs> Mad Mountain Mud, many talents. Unfortunately for Proxmire, the newspaper became a valuable resource. That's where he can mine information on all of these cases. So this takes us up to 1988. 1988, under President Ronald Reagan, the U.S. finally decides to become a signatory of this, and 
they're going to be quite a step forward. We've got what we call the Proxmire Act. Officially, it's also known as the Genocide Convention Implementation Act of 1987. And that binds the United States to the provisions of the United Nations Convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. So now the US steps in. The next step, but of course it's not over, uh, you've got a crime, but now you need a court, and things fall into limbo again, and we do not see the establishment of a court to try something that has now been identified as a crime uh, until July of 19, uh, 2002. That's when we get the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Right? This, the ICC is going to punish crimes against humanity, genocide, and war crimes. It's going to be based in the Hague. There are going to be three types of crimes that it's going to try. Those committed in member states, those, those committed by people of member states. So it's not only governments, but it can be people within a government. And then those the UN Security Council want to investigate. 18 judges, no two from one country, hoping to keep the, the boundaries balanced. By January of 2008, 105 countries are part of the ICC, not the United States. It, uh, two years later, we get the war in Bosnia. Four years later, or sorry, the same year we get the war in Bosnia. Uh, four or two years later, we get the war in Rwanda. What is the leading, does anybody know the leading story on the front page of the newspaper where the plane went down in Rwanda that launches genocide? What, what led in American newspapers on that day? That was, uh, for those of you who are interested, that was April the 4th, 1994. Do we have no young music fans? Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain. The death of Kurt Cobain captured the newspaper. Not Rwanda, but the death of Kurt Cobain. Uh, to bring the ICC up to date, Currently, we have 139 signatories. We have 122 of those signatories have ratified. So we have, and you need 60 ratifications to that passed in, in uh, the Rome Statute. Right? The Rome Statute is now active. We've got more than 60. To date, I cannot find any information. Uh, the Bush administration turned down opening discussion on genocide. The Obama administration was picked up opening a conversation on genocide and the U.S. ratified the document it signed, but to date, the Obama administration has taken no action on that point. So the U.S. still remains outside that loop. So what does this mean in a, in a classroom setting? As we say, motivated largely by the Holocaust uh, interest, which started in the late 80s. We get an interest in the, in the mid-90s also sparked by Bosnia and Rwanda. This comes with the age of mass television. We get global awareness of what's going on. We start to see pictures of starving bodies in concentration camps, and it brings back information of 50 years ago. We have, um, we still have a very contested definition, however, of genocide. Um, people don't know when they want to use the term, because legally the US doesn't use the term, because they've not ratified. The questions that I'm going to have you explore are questions like genocide. How and is it different than Holocaust? Is it different than ethnic cleansing? How or is it different than massacre? Are there other terms? What do we do? And then one of the reasons that the US is reluctant to get involved with crimes of genocide is we have the issue of atomic weapons. Was Hiroshima and Nagasaki an act of genocide? What about the firebombing of the Brits and the Americans in Dresden? at the end of World War II. Is that a genocide? These are a lot of the arguments that come up. A couple of points to consider when you're working on a definition of genocide. Uh, defining the victim. Who defines the victim? Who defines who's going to be responsible in case of genocide? Uh, there's also the, so who gets to, to determine the categories. There's also the issue of intent versus the issue of action. So do you measure genocide on what the perpetrator intends to do, or what the perpetrator actually carries out? Because if we look at the Holocaust, uh, Hitler failed. He had records of 12 million Jews in Europe, and he 
and I put this in quotation marks, only fill 6 million. 50%. 50% is a poor return. 6 million is devastating. So it depends on, on, what's, on what side you look at. So these are questions to, to take out. The last point I want to finish up with my last two minutes is the question of what now? You give the students all of this information, you show them all the pictures, they have this lengthy discussion on what is genocide. What do you do? How do you move on from here? If you read any genocide textbook, and there are now thousands of them out there, the last chapter is always the most problematic because it's the what do we do now chapter, and it sounds like we should all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> it sounds very, very idealistic, very, very optimistic, and if we, we, why can't we all just get along? But that is the quintessential problem with genocide is how do you write a chapter that gives practical solutions when really what you want to do is you've got to find a way to stop genocide, but how do we do that? Um, a couple of things that, that I proposed with students in my class, and that is looking at the term activism and defining it in a concrete manner. What do we mean by activism? For many students, activism means I have to get on a bus with my placards, go to Washington, and march on the mall. I can't do that, I have a football game on Saturday. <laughs> my parents are not going to let me go to Washington. No way. So activism is out. But does activism have to be placards on the mall in Washington, or can it be something else? Can it be asking people around you, I know it sounds like a weird conversation, but you'd be surprised how often it comes up. I like it. I like genocide. How do you define it? At the very least, it clears the table with a coffee shop. Um, but no, you, you, you know, we've all had those family discussions that start in the heated topics, and then you realize that people having the discussions haven't defined their parameters. That's activism. Uh, believe it or not, popular magazines, I will use women's fashion magazines as an example. Marie Claire, 205 pages of how to apply lipstick, five pages, well, 204 one on shoes, five pages on social events around the globe, often covering cases of genocide. Cosmo, 210 pages of how to apply lipstick, four pages on shoes, nothing on genocide. Is it activism to spend $4 on one and not the other? So getting across to students, the term activism is a much smaller issue. I think the other issue that is very interesting when it comes to activism is the question of social media. And what is social media going to do in the 21st century about genocide? Uh, am I so optimistic that we are going to eliminate genocide with social media? Probably not. But instant communication the knowledge we had about the Prague Spring was a very different set of knowledge than we had about the Berlin Wall. So what does instantaneous communi communication do about building a larger community? Uh, you look at the, the, the protests around the, the Coney and the film that went out and the knowledge that went out there. Problematic as well. All of this is problematic. But it's very interesting to look at students and, and ask them what role they think social media is going to play on this because it gives them it gives them a sense of, of empowerment because they're, frankly, they're the ones that, that know how to work it. At least my experience is they're the ones that know how to work it. Right. So the, the question that remains out there is, what is going to happen to genocide coverage? What is going to happen to our education in genocide now that we have, in the last couple of years, something that we didn't have in Bosnia, something we didn't have in Rwanda, something we didn't really even have in Darfur? 